Good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome to you, to our Billericay and Little Bursted Team Ministry team service. It's great to see you all here. And a special welcome to Jane Walker from the Purple Community Fund, who will be speaking to us later on. And we look forward very much to hearing what you have to share with us, Jane. We are going to begin now with uh, worshipping our God, uh, How Great Thou Art, which will be on the screen. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. O oh Lord my God, when Then sings my soul, my Saviour God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Saviour shall come with shouts of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then shall I bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God how Then sings my 
going to pray together the opening prayer that you'll find in the orders of service. So we pray together. We are here to worship and we gather in different places. We are here on site, online and offline. We are meeting as the body of Christ. We are here watching and waiting. We are here praying and listening. We are here reading our Bible. We are here opening up our heart. We are here worshipping Almighty God. We are here the church triumphant, joining together in God's name. Amen. the collect for the last Sunday after Trinity. Merciful God, teach us to be faithful in change and uncertainty, that trusting in your word and obeying your will, we may enter the unfailing joy of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. We're going to worship now through song once again as the worship group leads us. Oh, 
My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Let's sing that verse again. My hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone. seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil my anchor holds within the veil Christ shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in Him be found, dressed in His righteousness alone. For less I stand before the Father, we thank you that our faith is made strong in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that you can encourage us in worship through the ministry of your word, through the sharing of communion. Father, we pray that you would draw us closer to you this morning and all that we share together, that you would strengthen our fellowship as a team ministry here this morning. And Father, that as we would leave this place, each one of us would say that we were glad that we went to the house of the Lord. And Father, we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Would you all please be seated? You're all in fine voice this morning. It sounded great from the front. Did it sound good where you were? Yeah. We'll have a few more a little later as a service. I want to say thank you to the band this morning, the boy band we call them. Let's just give them a round of applause. <clears throat> I keep saying if you have a name, we'll use it, but the boy band seems to be sticking. Uh, Quite flattering for some of them. (laughs) Actually, for three of them, but I'm not going to go there. Not going to go there. Anyway, it's lovely to see you. It's lovely to have Jane Walker with us this morning. Jane, let's just give Jane a very warm round of applause. 
Come and join us. Some of you will know that I spent uh, six weeks of my sabbatical in 2019 in the Philippines with Jane. Saw the side of her that I didn't like. No, that's not true. <laughs> it's lovely to have you with us, Jane. You're a real friend of, uh, not just for me, but for many of us here in, uh, in the team. We've loved having you. I'm just thinking when was the last time you were here? It was about two years ago and before that. It was like pre-pandemic. So how are you keeping nowadays? Well, yeah, I am well. I have a, a baker's cyst on the back of my knee, but apart from that, I'm, I'm well. <laughs> I don't even know what one of Has anybody else got one of those? Okay. Is it painful? Okay, just get on with it. So you've had a bit of a journey this morning. Tell us where you've travelled from today. Uh, I came from Southampton, so I got up at five this morning. I was so grateful that the clocks went forward. because <laughs> Back, sorry, yeah, back, yeah, yeah. An extra hour in there. Uh... Yeah, so um, tell us what have you been doing since the last time we saw you? Have you had a chance? I know post pandemic has been quite a challenge traveling to the Philippines and ministering over there and what have you. So, what have you been up to since we last saw you? Have you had a chance to go over there? Yes, I've been, I've been twice. Um, so, I've, I've stayed for three months uh, at the beginning part of the year. Uh, it's a little bit challenging for me to go back any further because I'm also caring for my sister um, and that's uh, and her husband who are both not well I mean they are recovering um, and so it's been really wonderful to go back I have to say I'm you, you kind of brave things out when I'm here I just I just know that I need to you know raise the funds and and um, you know help help the team overseas and we do we zoom almost every day and we do a lot of talking on Facebook and WhatsApp and Viber all sorts of different mediums but there's nothing like being with the team face to face yeah um, I think I don't think any of us stopped crying for about the first three days, which was really lovely. <laughs> we hadn't seen me for three years, and I hadn't seen them for three years. That was the longest time we've ever been apart. So yeah, it's been lovely to be back with them. And I'll go back again in January and come back um, end of March. Yeah. Okay. So crying because they were glad to see, you or crying because you had turned up. Uh, I, hope, I, hope it, I hope it was happy. <laughs> We had cake. <laughs> we, had, we had a lot of cake. <laughs> they made the most amazing cake. What's that purple fruit? Ube. Ube. Oh. Delicious. You can make jelly, cake, ice sweets, ice cream. You can't get it over here, but it's uh, very delicious. I picked out on that, I think, when I was there. What's the biggest challenge then for uh, the Purple Community Fund at the moment? Okay, well, it's, this is a story I think that all of you have heard many times before, but I think our biggest challenge right now is getting insufficient funds for the program. So for the first time in 21 years, I've actually peeled back the programs um, due to lack of funding, and that's never happened before. I've always winged it. Um, we've always kind of said, well, we know things are hard, but, you know, we have, you know, this never-ending faith and trust in God that he'll provide and I think we've got quite comfortable um, in that um, belief for the last like 21 years so it's hit us quite hard because we haven't you know we just keep thinking something's going to turn up and then we're at the point where it's like actually we need to cut back um, but I am very confident in this that whenever the charity or myself or any of us go through difficult times it's it feels a bit like purging um, and it's very easy to get depressed and it's very easy to kind of fall into you know what have I done wrong and start blaming myself and um, I'm just reminded of the many many times that that we've gone through difficult times we have always come out stronger at the other end because during that lean period we're looking for other avenues of where blessings might come from and then we just find that God just guides us there it's just unfortunate that we're in that painful stage right now <laughs> so we're looking forward to when that opens up but yeah that's that's currently where we are but um what's wonderful is that the community really appreciate everything that we've done especially during the pandemic um, and so I think they were almost anticipating that there might be a pulling back at some point. So, yeah. But the community there didn't just have a pandemic to uh, 
con big, you know, anxious and concerned about wasn't there a, a large fire then? There was a huge hurricane sort of ripped through. The, how did the community, what, what devastation was caused and actually how did people respond to that? Uh, but the fire was awful because that was the first time that the whole community had been confined to their area. So it, at any one time, there's never like two families living next door to each other. They're always out. But of course, when the fire came, everybody was inside because it was during lockdown. Uh, and it just went through like a tinderbox and it left uh, just under four and a half thousand people homeless. And that was the most that we've ever had to contend with. So we took a decision. We opened up all of our centres. Uh, we petitioned the mayor to let the um, evacuees go into the schools. Um, and because we were able to raise the profile of the families, uh, we were able to get from help from the government. We were able to build over 400 new homes, and the government built some as well, and basically everybody got rehoused um, at the end of it. But when the typhoons came, it, um, those houses stood, which was good, um, but, but then a whole load of other houses got washed away in the typhoon. But the families know this is going to happen. At least they hope it's not going to happen every year, but they know it's going to happen at least once every two years. And they own everything they own, they own very lightly. So nothing they own really defines them. They have a very kind of um, let go kind of feeling with everything that they own so that when these disasters happen, they're still in a very strong and positive mindset, which is so encouraging for us. Um, it ha makes me realize that maybe we could do a bit more of their, of their resilient spirit here, but they, but they are very inspirational, yeah. I was just thinking that. I don't want to ask you too many questions, but I don't want to take over what you're going to be saying a bit later. Um, one of the good things, I, I, one of the things I realized when I was in the Philippines is how small people are. And uh, Jane is just the perfect height uh, of a Filipino uh, to minister to. But can you remember you, what they used to call me? Oh, I can't, no. I should have primed you for that. I should have. No, well, what does the word guapo mean? Oh, handsome. Yeah, that's, thank you. Okay. So, so the, the, the lead. How did you forget that? Um, and they used to call me Pastor Guapo. It wasn't Pastor Paul. It was Pastor Guapo, Pastor Handsome. So I was hoping I wouldn't have to prime you to do that. And uh, I just have. So um, they must have said that when I wasn't listening very well. <laughs> Jane, they said it all the time. <laughs> On that note, ladies and gentlemen, let's give a very warm, appreciative welcome to Jane. <laughs> uh, and uh, we're going to have our Bible reading. Good morning, everyone. The reading this morning is from Mark's Gospel... Chapter 11, verses, reading for verses 12. And it can be found on page 1573 of the Black Bibles and 1016 of the Red Bibles. Jesus clears the temple. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of, of, of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him, 
because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, they went out of the city. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. I tell you the truth, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. This is the word of the Lord. Father, I thank you for bringing me safely here. I thank you for the, the partnership and the relationship that has been developed over the years with the church. Father, I pray that you know me, you know what's inside my heart, you know everything. I just pray, Lord, that now you would just become my mouthpiece. Let me say the things that you want me to say. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hmm. Yeah, interesting Bible verse. Um, believe what you ask for, believe that you've already received it. Isn't that difficult to do? Um, that if you have a need, okay, like me, <laughs> at the charity, we have a need. Um, and yet the Lord tells us that we are to ask him for those needs to be met. And go beyond that and believe that we actually have them. Um, so I don't know if anybody here has, has ever imagined that they've won the lottery. Um, I do it sometimes when I'm driving because it kills the time a bit and what I would do with all the money. Um, and then if you really think about that for a long time, or maybe not the lottery because that's not good, is it, with the church? <laughs> <laughs> but just say we inherited a lot of money. Um, and, uh, and I don't play the lottery, by the way, but, so I could never win it, even if I did. Um, but it, it's that kind of feeling that, wow, I've got all this money and I can, and I can do all these things and help, help all these people. Um, and I haven't got the money, but I feel as if I have. And I think that's kind of what the Bible is, is trying to tell us, is that be strong in that faith that we have what we've asked for. Um, so that is something that I've tried to do all the way through the, the charity since it started. Um, it's always been built on faith. Uh, Right from day one, I had no idea how to fund um, the programs, but I was sat in an internet cafe next to a gentleman um, who actually looked a lot like my, um, Omar Sharif. Uh, and he was sat there, and I was struggling with, and I, well, I genuinely was struggling um, with my internet, and um, it was when it had only just come out, and he offered to help me, and I was trying to send an email to my sister. Uh, and so he helped me, and he asked me what I was doing in the Philippines, and I told him that I had stumbled on these children in uh, an open landfill site, and there were thousands of them that were living and working there. There were families that were um, living in this toxic environment and unable to feed their children, so their children had to work with them, um, and I was just wanting to help them. And he said, could I come and have a look with you? So we got in a taxi and we went together and I took him to the dump site and I showed him um, the families and then I took him to the derelict building that I was in the process of renovating to, to start as a school. Uh, and he saw all of that and without any hesitation, he just said to me, well, I'm an investment banker in Jersey. <laughs> so... That felt a bit like the lottery coming in. Um, and, uh, and he said, I want to help you. So he said, I don't usually help charities. I usually help the founders of the charities. Um, but he said, in your case, I'm going to do both. 
So he said, I will pay all your airfares um, and any accommodation costs or anything that you have when you need to come back to the Philippines. Uh, and he said, I will also fund 200 um, of the child working children to come in to your school. So that was just amazing. And as it turned out, he was a Christian as well. Um, but we both of us didn't know that until after uh, we started talking. And there are many miracles like that in my journey of, the, of running the charity, uh, especially um, in the very early days when I wasn't earning um, any money and I was, I was struggling and I was living by faith and I was just saying to God, oh, I don't know how I'm going to pay these bills. And I had a real sense, don't look at the bills I thought, oh, that's quite, that's quite good. I'd continue to do that. Um, um, and I was worried. I had a little son, and I didn't have um, enough money sometimes for food. Uh, and I remember this one time in particular, we were really out of food. And it wasn't when food banks were up and running that much either. Uh, and I opened my front door, and there was a massive bag of groceries. And what it was is the next-door neighbours had gone on holiday across the road, had gone on holiday, and they'd asked me to water their tomatoes, which I said I would. Um, and they decided that when they go on holiday, they shut their fridge and their freezer down, and they gave me the entire contents of their fridge and freezer. But I never told a living soul that I was going through that particular hardship. Um, so it really felt like a, a blessing from God. And these small things built my faith bit by bit because I had only just become a Christian when I went to the Philippines. So I really wasn't a churched missionary, so to speak. Uh, and uh, I would, uh, I remember one time, another time, I was um, washing clothes with the, with the women in the community. Um, so we all squat down and they laughed a lot at me because they say white women don't know how to hand wash and they were right. Uh, well, this white woman doesn't know how to hand wash, that's for sure. And they taught me how to hand wash and we would talk together. And I had invited the um, UK ambassador and his wife to our programme that particular day and they turned up with their armed guards and their security and their big guards and they came and they saw the work and they met me and I was filthy dirty um, and they walked around and then they said to me that they'd never in all of their years of travelling they had never been to an area so poverty stricken as the area that I was working in and they felt incredibly moved by that, um, by that thing. They, went, they then said to me, you know, what fundraising did I do in the Philippines? And I said, oh, I didn't do too much. I'm just very busy developing the programs with the, with the families. So the ambassador's wife said, I will make it my mission in life that people will get to know about your work. Um, and so she did. And then one day she said to me, would you like to come to my house? I have the CEO of Shell, of some of the banks, the big names um, were at her house. And she said, and I think it will be good for you to be there, just you can talk to them. And you never know, they might give you some money. And I said to her, I feel really nervous to do that. I feel quite shy. Um, and because I had been a homeless child when I was younger, didn't finish my education, I've always felt a little bit intimidated by people that, have, that are more educated than I am. So I felt quite scared. And I told her. Um, and she said to me, don't worry. I will wait for you at the front door. Just text me when you're coming. Um, and then I will show you around. So that's what I did. And she met, she talked introduced me to the CEO of Shell and all these different people. And the minute they started asking me what it was that I did, I lost all my fear. And I was able to speak confidently um, because, and passionately because I loved and believed fully what I do. And by the time I left that particular dinner, I had three or four pledges of donors that wanted to give. And Shell was one of them. And they are still one of our donors. So it's when we come out of our comfort zone, God meets us. Um, sometimes we just have to put the first step out, um, and he will meet us. Um, and I believed that 
Jill was going to help me with these people and she was going to give me confidence um, when I spoke to them. Uh, and, and that helped. And the whole life of the charity has been like this. People were asking to sponsor children and we started running a sponsorship program. We still run it now. You can sponsor a child um, through education and you'll have communication with them and letters and updates. Uh, and I had no idea how valuable that program was, but whenever I spoke, I used to talk about it. Um, and if it wasn't for that sponsorship program and people donating money to us regularly every month, we would have closed years ago, absolutely years ago. It has been the backbone of our work, knowing that we've got money coming in every month. We can plan, we know what we, know what we can afford and we know what we can't afford. Um, and because we have gone through times when, remember the tsunami, when the big tsunami came? We didn't raise any money for three months. <laughs> three whole months. All, all, everybody, all the public and all of our donors, everybody was diverting their funds over um, into Thailand and, and the different countries, Sri Lanka, that were affected. And it, there was nothing wrong with that. Um, but it was challenging for us. And it was the standing monthly orders that held us in those three months. And the same with during the pandemic. Although we have lost um, monthly standing orders, we've still maintained some, um, and that's helped us. Uh, and that was an idea that was just uh, came to me one day that maybe we could learn how to sponsor um, and manage a sponsorship program. And I think if we don't have fear, um, and I'm saying this to myself today more than I am anybody else because I am fearful for the charity. I am fearful that we have never experienced lean times like this. I've had to make redundancies. I've had to cut back on the programs. Some of the students now don't get food packs. They only, only 145 children get them. Those are the ones that are most at risk. Costs have gone up in the Philippines, but we're not able to give our students extra money to meet those costs. So we've even had some students dropping out. And it, it feels like an unraveling. Um, and it's painful. Because I love them deeply. But it's also not my responsibility to do that, to do those things for them. This is as much their journey and their path as it is mine. Um, and what it's done is it's brought the community together. Um, they know that we're having hard times because they've never experienced us cutting back before. Um, and they send me messages literally every day. Ma'am, don't give up. Keep going on. All the help you've given us all the years, we'll find ways, we'll find ways. That's all I keep hearing from them. We will find ways. Never one person has complained. Not one person has said, you promised you would do this, you would do this. Not one of them have pointed the finger. They've all just gathered together and just said, we'll pray. We'll, we'll, find, we'll find ways. We will find a way through this. And it's spoken volumes to me because it's reminded me very much that I am not in this on my own. I am in this with you guys. I am in this with the families in the Philippines. I'm in this with anybody that supports us in any way with any of our volunteers. And it's that sense of family that God brings together. Uh, and, and I wanted to share that with you because it's, it would be very easy for me to stand up and tell you all the bad things and all, all, the, all the sad things that are, are happening without giving you what I believe is the positive side of this, is that, yes, it's difficult right now, but we know it won't be forever, and we know that God will bring us through, just like he has done so many times. We've been especially blessed um, this year because we had 40 graduates from university, and most of those students were the original child workers when I started educating them about 18 years ago. So it's a long education journey in the Philippines. Some of them were in the charcoal pits. 
Some of them were picking up waste and, and some of them were picking up leftover foods to peel off and, and refry and cook. And it's something they call pag pag. Um, and it's, it's when they have no money for food. Uh, and those very same children came into our school, were nurtured um, and stayed with us. And we provided the right level of financial support for them and emotional support and spiritual support for them so that they remained in education and they didn't drop out to help mum and dad. They believed in their dream and held to it. Um, and their faith got them through many times. And now those students are at the end of their education journey now, and they, were, they have graduated. Um, so these 40 students, they excelled beyond anything I could ever imagine, because they graduated as marine biologists, um, criminologists, uh, we have one vet there, nurse, um, a pharmacist, as well as teachers and nurses. And these are children that people used to see as scavengers, dirty and smelly, and nobody really wanted to be involved with those families because they're quite, their problems are quite severe and difficult to tackle. And yet those 40 students graduated um, and have shown everybody that um, it doesn't matter where you begin. Um, as long as you follow your path and you follow your journey, um, you will get to where um, your heart desires. They never doubted that they would graduate as university students. They never doubted that. Um, and that helps me, um, that I must never doubt either, that we will always find ways to get through. Um, so I have a, a very short video um, to play. It's only uh, five minutes, but it just walks you through the community. Uh, and some of the students are going to speak just about their, um, their experiences and where they are now. And then I don't know if I'm very happy, because I know I'm a little bit early. <laughs> uh, and that's, uh, that's unusual for me. Um, so I don't know if we could do a question and answer se section after the video. After the video? Yeah, yeah. I mean, to be short winded, it's quite unusual for you, Jen. Isn't I know. I know. Yeah. I'm quite surprised. I think you took the wind out of my sails when I didn't remember the, how grappo you were. <laughs> the Purple Community Fund's work spans over 21 years. We've provided poverty reduction programme for over 2 million people, working with the poorest of the poor communities in the Philippines. Our work started with child workers, children who were looking for pieces of plastic and metal in the dump sites and were working in the charcoal pits. Education is central to our work. We started nutrition programmes, providing meals for malnourished children and senior citizens, providing emergency food packs for families in crisis and food packs for our students so that they had food to go to school. Our health programmes have helped nearly 180,000 people, providing doctors and nurses and midwives, giving free doctors consultation, free medicines, vitamins, free hospital tests and, where necessary, operations. Our social workers are central to our work. They assess every single family. They conduct home visits. They signpost them to the programmes in PCF that are needed. They provide help in disaster and provide relief programmes for families who've been affected by fire or by typhoons. And our livelihood programme is essential. It works with parents of our school children, providing them with a sustainable income. We make beautiful handmade products from the rimples from recycled canned drinks. These products have given the mothers an income and the ability to pay for their food for their families and provide for them. We also make shoes from the aeroplane tyres for the sole of the shoe and the inner tube of the truck tyre for the body of the shoe. But the pandemic years have taken its toll on our work and our funds are now depleted. Our education programme is most at risk and we're appealing to you to help us 
sponsor children so that they can complete their education. Here are a few words from some of the children who we've helped. I get bullied in our school because some of the students hate the person that is working in a charcoal factory because they said that they're all stinky and dirty. And I can still remember back then we ate almost every day the fried chicken that is a leftover by a different customers from a different fast food chain. PCF helping me whereas they provide a school uniform, a shoes and school supplies for me and they even also provided a transportation allowance and food packs for my family every week. Because of your support, the boy who were a charcoal factory worker before is now soon to be a licensed pharmacist. Thank you very much. When I gave birth to my daughter, she has a club foot condition. It was really heavy for me to see her like that. Um, accepting us with the new, new responsibilities like the baby was very heavy for my mother. While I was in the Upskills Plus Foundation livelihood program, Mang Jane came back here in the Philippines and she saw my child and then she asked me if there's anything that he, she can help us. That's when she helped us in the medication of Crystal. Upskills Plus Foundation had, had believed in me that even though I have my own family, I can overcome all the hardship of having a family and then continuing with the education. And now currently, I am a fourth year student graduating and surely I will be uh, in a better position. I will provide for the family that I have now. I remember one time um, my bag and my shoes got wet during a rain and I felt guilty because my brother had to stay at home and because I have to use his shoes so I can go to school. Um, I have to reuse my old school uniforms because my mom can't afford to buy the new ones. And as a scholar, it's really hard to focus on schools because I don't have enough um, school supplies. And that is why we're, I'm very grateful to the Purple Community Fund, especially to Mom Jane, for providing everything that we need for our education. And with that, we would be grateful if you can support the Purple Community Fund for a good cause. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching our video. If you would like to sponsor some of the children or would like to purchase some of the handmade products made from the wrinkles from canned drinks, please come and visit our table and talk to me. Thank you. Yeah, Jamilin, uh, who uh, was second on, um, she's now a fully licensed social worker and she was offered uh, a job with the Department of Social and Welfare um, for a higher salary than we could afford to, to pay, um, but she turned it down and she said she wanted to work with, with us. Um, she wanted to work in her community and she wanted to give back to her community and we're so grateful for her because she is an amazing social worker. Um, so um, we just have a few minutes for any questions and um, we'll bring the microphone to you if you want to ask them. If anybody wants to put a hand up or any questions you've got. Oh, I can't believe you're all silent. Oh, there's some... Oh, the, yeah, I, yeah when, I know, but there's also, there's also one there. <laughs> and thank you, all of you, for collecting ring pulls. I'm going back with a really big bag of ring pulls today, so thank you. Um, it's a really simple question. What took you to the Philippines in the very beginning? Um, Gross dissatisfaction working with Rupert Murdoch is really what got me there. Um, yeah. 
<laughs> so I'd been in the newspaper industry for about 12 years and they promoted me, uh, which meant I needed to work in London with the Mirror Group and I wasn't, I was really un uncomfortable with my career in the newspaper industry, especially as I had just become a Christian and the ethics and the morals were considerably questionable, to say the least. So I decided to go to the Philippines and I asked work if I could have a sabbatical from work, which they agreed and they gave me three months off. Um, and I wanted to go to the Philippines because I knew it was predominantly English speaking and they had really lovely beaches, absolutely beautiful beaches. And I thought, oh, this is a great way to, you know, I, I bought a Bible and I thought, oh, I can learn about Christianity when I'm there um, and I can, you know, decide if this is the career path. Well, the first thing I did when I got to the Philippines was I bought a newspaper, and in that newspaper were stories of children who were being evicted and their families from these squatter areas. And I got curious, jumped in a taxi and asked a taxi driver to take me to the biggest squatter area he knew, which he did, it was the largest in the Philippines. Um, and, and then I followed these two little boys up a dirt track and that's when I discovered the landfill site because there was no other charities or anything there. And from that moment on, um, I remembered, I'd been reading the book of James and I remember it in the book of James, it says that um, what good is your faith if it has no actions? Um, and it really, it kind of really hit home to me and I thought I want to do everything I can to help these children have a better life. And by the time I went back to England, I had no desire in my heart at all to go back to the newspaper industry, so I resigned uh, and then um, studied how to run a charity in the UK and the Philippines and went back. So it was, a, it was an interesting journey. So I didn't do a lot of beaches, by the way, which was a, which was a shame. <laughs> uh, there was a gentleman here. He went oh, you've got your own mic, that's good. <laughs> Um, it's just really to sort of unpack the, the problem you have with funding. Um, are you predominantly um, looking at the, the UK to fund PCF? You know, from are your you know the people who support you are they mainly from the UK or? It's about fifty fifty. Right. Yeah, it's about fifty fifty. So um, we're always working to get our. Um, charity in the Philippines more uh, less reliant on the UK um, but we've also been hit two sides so um, in the Philippines we have donors that have been uh, you know funding our education programs one of them gives us around about 50,000 a year um, and cut their donation by half um, it just because they don't the fact their foundation doesn't have money anymore and they said we were only one of two that um, have that they that they're still supporting, so they dropped a whole load of others. So basically, what they're saying was, be grateful. <laughs> we can only give you twenty-five, but not fifty. So we, I think we found we found we found challenges in the Philippines as well um, as in the UK. But most definitely in the UK, our income has been affected. I mean, to maybe this is a good example um so in 2020 i mean we normally raise about 800,000 to 900,000 pounds a year so um in 2020 we raised 870,000 pounds a year in 21 we raised 650,000 pounds a year in 22 we raised 500,000 pounds a year and this year to date we have only raised 280,000 so where I had been building my funding pots, um, because I've, I'm luckily my um, difficult beginnings have always made me quite careful with finances. <laughs> so I've always had reserve funding and we've had money in the pots. These four years, it, this being the fourth year, has really depleted us. So I think it was just seeing that go from 870, 650, 500, 280. So I think that's where, that's where it's come. Um, but we have um, some people that want to help us fundraise and take it to corporates in, in maybe different ways that they had. So we're, we, we, just need, we just need to find new ways, really. Yeah. Does, that, does that answer it? It does. It's not the answer I wanted to hear, really, but, uh, but it sounds so... But it's the honest one. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, I, I, 
I think I'm so used to always being so, and we're doing this and we're doing that, and you know, and I think I'm so used to that that I've, it, it's you know you you kind of like sit in this time and think. But I also mentor some other CEOs from smaller charities as well, um, and everybody is feeling it. So yeah. it's um, you know it's it's all about getting your mindset right and putting your faith um, squarely with God and knowing that this is God's work. Um, and it's going through a transitional time um, and I hope to come back in a couple of years time and tell you what that miracle was because I'm, I'm without question that it will come yeah oh, it's make it, you're, making a, you're making a walk aren't you Pauline <laughs> he, hasn't had, he hasn't had to walk far from me oh not for you, no that's no. good um, I was just wondering have you got links with I suppose it's a two-part question, really. Have you got links with any other churches? Because I'd never heard of this until we started coming to this church. And also, I've never really seen any publicity for it outside of Emmanuel Church, if I'm perfectly honest. And I just wonder how, how much wider you go, really. I suppose that's the question. Yeah, I think um, what we tend to do is every, every penny that we get, it goes it basically goes directly to the philippines to to help um so we don't really have a lot of money on advertising the most thing that we do would be a newsletter but we raise our funds from a variety of places so we we have about four um churches that that um pray for us and 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 support us in one way or another um we raise funds through grant making corporations and trusts um, and through individuals that give by monthly standing order um, and as well from the products made from the ring pools. So um, all the women have been paid for making those products uh, and then 100% of the profits from those products goes back into the education of the children. So um, that's, that's kind of where how we raise our funds and maybe how far the reach goes. But in terms of... Um, advertising maybe on, on television or in magazines we, 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 we don't do that yeah, it's more, more just because of the finances um, not many but just a few yeah yeah not many but a few yes um, it's around about four that I would say like I always know you guys pray for us um, you know you support us when you can um, so we have about four churches that I would say are you know are hardcore churches and, and you know there are others that are maybe a bit more ad hoc um. Hi Jane Hi Fully. I do know your story because I met you long before you ever came here I'm trying to think I was at a Christian summer camp and you were yeah, there with the table um, and I invited you to come to speak to Mother's Union. So one of the things you said earlier, you might not want to say any more about it, but you said you didn't finish your education. Um, I wondered if you wanted to say a bit more about that. And the second thing I just wanted to say, I did start having um, table sales of Jane's products a few years ago. Um, you order a whole box of stuff that costs a couple of hundred pounds and you're responsible for it and you sell it. But I couldn't sustain it on my own. I tried to get yeah. one or two other people to assist me in that and it, from here and it didn't happen. So if anyone would like to assist me in doing that again, I'm quite happy to do it. Oh, thank you, Pauline. Yeah. Good plug. Yeah, very good, very clever. <laughs> we don't charge you 200. You, you have the box and then you sell, you sell what you can, but that, that's always a help, um, definitely. Um, right, okay, so my education. So um, my family decided it was a good time for me to leave home when I just turned 15. Um, so I didn't really get to do mock O-levels and I didn't get to do my O-levels and I was, obviously now it's GCSEs, but um, so I missed that opportunity. So um, when I started working, I mean I started as a chambermaid and then a waitress and then when I started in the newspaper industry, um, I just started as a sales girl, um, but I did really well. Um, and what I found with the newspaper industry, they weren't particularly interested in qualifications. You just needed to have common sense, really, and that was something I think I had, and I was very hard-working. Um, so 
but but because I because when I meet people um, that have university degrees, or at least I did back in those days, um, and I felt that you know they were more accomplished you know than I was, then I, I felt a little bit intimidated by it. But as the years have gone on, I have learned that it's not the education that maketh the man, <laughs> um, and it is most definitely the heart. Um, that maketh a person. Um, if you have the the passion and the love and and the desire to serve, um, then that supersedes any university degrees or or qualifications that I can have. Because um, whatever you do, if you don't do it with love and you don't do it with passion, it actually is worth absolutely nothing. Um, and I've met many educated scholars um, who have been without that passion and in it and it's lifeless so yeah so that that's um, that's my that's my evolved story but when I first started that was how I felt and I'm Jill knocked that out of me because she must have pushed me in front of at least a hundred CEOs in her time <laughs> and and that's all for me <laughs> thank you very much everybody for listening thank you Jane, thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, I found that really moving and, uh, and just really helpful. Thank you so much.
let us pray. Loving Lord, we give you thanks that so long ago you led Jane to that dump on the outskirts of Manila. We thank you that you gave her the vision that has become the Purple Community Fund. Seeing the people living in such abject poverty, she created this organisation that provides opportunities for these families to acquire new skills, to gain education and to prosper. Lord, we pray that this project will continue to thrive. Lord, we pray that the funding will be found. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to move through the war-torn parts of the world. Look with compassion on those who are at war with one another. Grant them the grace of reconciliation and peace of heart. God of all, we seek to heal the wounds of those who are suffering in our broken world. We give thanks, Lord, for the courage of the aid agencies and ask for your protection on them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of the seasons, we give you thanks for the rhythm of life by which our days are set. As day follows night, so harvest follows seed time. And we receive once more the provision of our Creator. From summer to winter, we are blessed by the crop of plenty which delights and sustains us through our seasons of life. God of the seasons, we give you thanks. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, we ask for your blessing on those who feel called to your service. Guide them at this time that they will lead their flock wisely. Give them joy as they reflect on your call and are open to share their faith with others. Give them grace for the work you are asking them to do and the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer and so Lord we give thanks for Paul's ministry here in Billericay we pray for your blessing on him and Paula as they prepare for his ministry in Paphos we pray for Margaret, Rupert and the leadership teams in the parish give them Lord the strength and resilience as they step up to fill the gap which will be left by his departure. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We bring before you our King and Queen. Guide them, Lord, as they seek to serve you and the wider family of the world. We thank you, Lord, for each member of our family for each of their yet, yet quite unique gifts. Help us to nurture their abilities and talents and to make the time to listen and care for each other. And as we juggle our busy lives, may we look out for each other within our family and the wider family of our church community. Fill us with your love and inspire us to live our lives 
in light and joy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Lord, we bring before you all those who are sick. We ask for your healing touch, Lord, and may they find comfort in your words. Please think of those who are special to you. And Lord, we pray for all those who mourn. Walk with them, Lord, and give them peace, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we finish with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Thank you very much indeed, Meryl, for those uh, lovely prayers this morning. Well, could I ask you to all please stand as we uh, share the peace with one another, uh, as we prepare to share communion together. The risen Jesus stood among his disciples and said, Peace be with you. They were glad when they saw the Lord. So may the peace of the risen Lord be always with you. Thank you. Let us offer one another a sign of his peace. So as we turn back to our service sheet, we pray together the prayer after communion. We have eaten bread to remember Jesus. We have drunk wine to remember Jesus. As we spread the good news through all the earth. Jesus is with us to the end of the world. Amen. Not many notices this morning, really trying to use to have notices uh, for the parish. Uh, just to remind you that uh, Jane's uh, amazing array of goods are in the lobby. Um, can people pay by card, Jane, or is it cash? Card, cash, IOUs, anything. Blank checks especially welcome. And uh, if you want to catch up the latest news, uh, there's plenty of these available uh, on tables and in the lobby. Uh, so don't uh, forget that. Um, Zoom prayers for the parish take place on a Wednesday at 6 o'clock. Come and join us if you're available. Just a reminder that next Wednesday, uh, Wednesday Sunday afternoon uh, at Christchurch is our annual memorial service. It's still not too late to invite someone along or to have someone's names read out. Sue's here. If you see Sue this morning, she can give you a slip and perhaps complete that before you leave. And... Uh, Remembrance Sunday, there's a service here at 9.15, but more especially there's a, an act of remembrance in the high street at 10.50. It'd um, be good if we could have a, a good church presence at that event as well. Oops. And uh, my farewell service is on the 26th of uh, November. I'm sure you know that at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Feels like the long goodbye. Everything is my last thing that I'm doing, but... Uh, it's as much of a joy and a sorrow for me as it is a sorrow and a joy, I think, uh, uh, for you. It would be lovely if you're able to come along uh, to that. And uh, always keep your eyes peeled on social media. There's always something uh, to be read. And before we go on to that, I've got... Uh, Simon has got a, um, 
That's a Paris notice, I think. Yes. Yes. I don't want to take Jane's thunder, so please make sure that you support her today with uh, her lovely goods that she's got out the front. However, this is the best chance I'm going to get to speak to so many people all at once. Uh, for the past few months, the congregation and I at St Mary the Virgin have been involved in a long-term project of preparing a calendar for raising funds. Uh, if you want to know more, please do see me. The cost is £9. It's got all full-colour images inside. I'm not going to spend any longer because I know we're close to the end, but if you want to see me afterwards and find out more, I'll be in and around the vestibule there. Thank you very much. And some of the photographs in there are quite amazing. I think you've taken quite a lot of them, Simon. Oh. oh. <laughs> you, you forgot to mention that. So the offering today um, is going towards the, the Purple Community Fund. You probably missed the basket when it came in. You can give on the way out if you want to use the cashless machine and the lobby. Everything that goes through there today will be going through to the Purple Community Fund. So we're going to sing our final song this morning. Uh, this is a song we sang quite a lot uh, at Emmanuel over the years as part of a sermon series that we did. You will all recognize the tune, but the words might be slightly different. So we stand as we sing together. The clue is it sounds very much like Abide With Me. We seek your kingdom throughout every sphere. We long for heaven's demonstration here. Jesus, your light shine bright for all to see. Transform. Revive and heal society.
Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendor, and the majesty, for everything in heaven and on earth is yours. And you reply, all things come from you, and of your own do we give you. So we come to the closing prayer on the last page of our sheets. From where we are to where you need us, Jesus, now lead us on. From the security of what we know to the adventure of what you will reveal, Jesus, now lead us on. To refashion the fabric of this world until it resembles the shape of your kingdom, Jesus, now lead us on. Because good things have been prepared for those who love God, Jesus, now lead us on. And so may the blessing of God Almighty. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you and those whom you love and those whom you pray for this day and always. Amen. Amen. Just a reminder.